carbon capture and storage is going to be relied upon to do a lot of the heavy lifting in decarbonization if we're going to get to a net zero by 2050 scenario. And especially in the hydrocarbon sector, that's particularly true. And I'm going to talk to Dr. Julia Atwood from Bloomberg NEF in the New York office because she's an expert in this area. So welcome to the interview, Julia. Thanks so much, Mark. I'm really happy to be here. Well, one of the questions that keeps popping up is just about the economics of, of carbon capture and storage. And, you know, some experts I talk to say it's not economic, won't be for a while. Others say, you know, maybe it is now or will soon be. What's your take on that? My take is essentially it depends on the application that you're using it for and the policy landscape that you have around you. So for example, in the US, which really leads the world in carbon capture capacity, you have a tax credit called 45Q. That's sort of the example to everyone else, what everyone wants to replicate. And that will hand out $35 a ton of CO2 if you're using the CO2, say for something like enhanced oil recovery, and $50 a ton if you're just putting it in the ground and using it as a decarbonization option. So essentially what these companies need in order to break even is for their capture and transport and storage costs to kind of meet that. There are some applications where we actually think those costs are below it. So something where you have a very pure stream of CO2 like ethanol refining, that could potentially be viable but something more like steel or cement capturing the CO2 emissions from those industrial processes, that's more difficult. Um, there's a lower concentration of CO2, you have to do more work to capture it. So the costs are naturally higher. So what are some of the industries where, and I mean, you mentioned a, a few of them, but uh, where are some of the industries where we expect CCS to really take off uh, this decade? I think the ones that are the most interesting to watch are really hydrogen production and then the industrial clusters. So particularly cement and steel. There's a couple of different reasons for those. There, we're seeing a big increase in demand for hydrogen. But if you're making green hydrogen with electricity and an electrolyzer, it's pretty expensive. But you can make hydrogen that is relatively competitive and lower carbon by using carbon capture and pairing that with your hydrogen production. So that's one interesting and really growing area. And then on the industrial side, it's really that those industries are starting to make net zero pledges. So they need some way to get their whole industry to zero emissions, but they have a lot of existing capacity. So especially in China, where most of the steel plants haven't been around for that long, they're only 10 years old. You don't wanna close them and build something else that's clean. So they're looking at these retrofitting um, technologies like CCS. And then I'll just mention cement because it's a particularly interesting one. More than half of cement's emissions are direct. They're coming from the chemical process when you're breaking down limestone. So even if you change your fuel to something clean, you still have more than half of the emissions that you have to deal with. So there's kind of a natural fit there for carbon capture. Now, do we have anything uh, in, in the US or elsewhere uh, that's working at a significant scale? Because this is one of the issues that we see about Western Canada with a lot of oil and gas, uh, uh, carbon capture and storage associated with oil and gas. And I think we've got about 7 million tons a year uh, of capacity now uh, just to decarbonize the oil sands. That'll probably have to go up to 40 or 50 tons a year within 30 years. But the one question that remains is, can it be scaled like that? What, what's your take on that? I think it can. Um, we're already seeing a pipeline that is going to massively increase the amount of carbon capture capacity globally. So right now, global capture capacity is about 40 million tons. And we think if all of the projects um, that have been announced and that have some chance of being commissioned are, we'll be at 193 million tons by 2030. Now, obviously that's an order of magnitude lower than global emissions right now, which are 50 billion tons, but it does show that there's a significant amount of scaling. And what's behind that is that CCS has been around for 
you know, 30 or 40 years. So there are a lot of companies out there that have experience in this. And at the end of the day, it's really just chemical reactions. It's compressing gas it's using solvents. These are all things that industry is pretty comfortable with. So it's about committing to these bigger projects. It's about building them over and over again so that you get those cost reductions that the industry needs to have everybody using this technology and not just pilot plants. Yeah, it's one of the things we've seen in the oil sands is as the company, once the company's built their, their plant, you know, uh, over the last, uh, say, uh, 15 or 20 years, they got really, really good at driving down costs. And uh, is that something that we'll see with uh, experience and learning and with scaling is a significant reduction in the costs of CCS? We think so. So we think that if you build the exact same CCS project over again, you can get a 20 to 30% reduction in the cost just by knowing where you can make things a little bit more efficient. And then if you make plants bigger, there's another 15% that you can save there just by scaling it up. So scale with pretty much everything helps you out a lot because you're using just larger equipment, and you have a proper supply chain behind you. So we think there are some cost reductions to come and we're starting to see just the beginnings of that really in the US. Are we gonna see uh, the Biden administration expand on 45Q? Oh, that is the big question. And that is what pretty much everyone in the capture industry in the US is asking for. So what they're saying is don't make it a tax credit, make it direct pay. That just simplifies everything. And they're also saying let's increase it a lot so that these industrial sectors with their higher capture costs, sometimes above $100 a ton, can make an economic case for it. So there are certainly people trying in Biden's administration and part of the infrastructure package that's just working its way through Congress. There is a big chunk of money set aside there, but it's for CCS demonstration projects rather than reforming 45Q. Um, but it's the one of very few pieces of carbon of climate legislation that does occasionally get bipartisan backing. So I would say keep your eye on it um, because it might be a good place to make some compromises. Now, of course, we often talk about carbon capture utilization and storage. And uh, on the, the U side of that equation, uh, are we gonna be seeing uh, captured CO2 turned into products? I mean, I've heard of soap, activated carbon. There's a, a number of them. We see a big expansion in that part of it. There's certainly a lot of exotic things you can make with CO2. You can even make carbon nanotubes out of it. The two that we think are the most viable right now are mixing that CO2 back into concrete or using it to cure cement, partly because it's such a massive industry that there's potential for quite a bit of demand there. And because you're only using a relatively small amount of it, you're not increasing your cost of concrete too much because that's the real challenge for a lot of these utilization products is that the whole idea of them is to make something with a CO2 feedstock that performs exactly the same as the original product, but it often has a pretty chunky price premium on top of it, which means you have to be convincing people to pay more just for sustainability. So the place where people may very well be willing to do that is really in fuels, especially for the aviation industry, because they have so few options in order to decarbonize their industry that they're looking at things like carbon offsets, which could be direct air capture, or at CO2 to fuels or synthetic fuels, where you take CO2, you mix it with hydrogen, and you create a fuel. And if you've taken that CO2 out of the atmosphere, then you can potentially get a CO2 neutral fuel, but it's tough to do. You have to control a lot of the parameters. Well, given the interest in, in CCUS and going forward, uh, any can you tell us what, what's your top expectation between now and say the next five or 10 years in terms of technology and, and deployment? What we're really keeping an eye on is what happens with direct air capture because if we think of CCUS as something that a lot of power plants and industrial companies do in order to get their young assets to net zero and sort of like run them out to the end of their lifetime, there's sort of a, an end to that industry, to that use. 
But what we think there is a really bright and pretty long future for is negative emissions. And so that's why we spend a lot of time looking at direct air capture, because we think that's going to stick around for a while and be needed for a long time to deal with the extra emissions from things like agriculture or from the last little bit that CCS plants can't capture. So we're watching to see if those direct air capture companies like Carbon Engineering there in Canada, like Climeworks, like Global Thermostat, how their large scale deployments go, because that's the acid test for them. Can they build a commercial scale plant? And if they can prove that, they can just make cookie cutter ones all around the world and start to recognize those cost reductions. Now, I'm kind of curious about that because there's been a lot of, I don't know, maybe healthy skepticism, we'll call, skepticism, we'll call it, about the cost of uh, and, and deploying those at scale. Uh, you know, the amount, the amount of uh, a plant that, uh, say, a carbon engineering would require to take any amount, significant amount of CO2 out of the, the atmosphere would be you know, quite significant. So I don't know. What's your, what's your uh, best guess at this point, whether that's going to be successful? Well, you're right that the costs are astronomically high right now. We see them at $600 to $700 a ton. And when you're comparing that to the um, carbon offset market, where some offsets are being sold for $10 or $15 a ton, it's quite a hard economic pill to swallow. Um, in terms of can the technology scale, can you build enough plants, it sort of remains to be seen right now. Fundamentally, the technologies that they're talking about are reasonably standard chemical reactions. So the ones that rely on solvents and rely on calcium oxide looping, that is an industrial process that could be scaled up fairly readily. Um, there's nothing fundamentally that difficult about it. When you're thinking about things where you're using coatings or you're using membranes, there's a lot of that supply chain that has to be scaled up because it's a special material that you're making just for this. So then there's a lot of infrastructure that has to go around it. So let's wait and see. I know that's, that's not the answer that a lot of people wanna hear, but let's wait and see for 2024, 2025. 2025 is really, if there's going to be a tipping point in CCS, it's gonna be around 2025 because that's when point source CCS scales up, that's when direct air capture scales up, that's when we'll know. Great, Julia, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. It's been a pleasure.